Welcome to the Creato Connection, where we broadcast programs of interest to leaders around the world who have made a commitment to operational excellence. You can find our broadcast schedule and enroll in any topic at www.creato.com forward slash events. Producing these programs reflects our commitment to the industry, and we also hope they will introduce us to opportunities to work with leaders like you. You'll find contact information and related offers at the end of this program. The program you've joined is titled Six Sigma Demystified, making products better, faster, and cheaper. Please note that this was a previously recorded event. The next voice you will hear is from CEO of Creato Performance Solutions, Mr. Ian Lazarus. Hello, everybody. It's Ian Lazarus, and thank you for joining us for Six Sigma Demystified. This is the second in a two-part series. I hope that you've had an opportunity to see our program on the introduction to Lean. If not, um, you can always go back to the Creato Connection and start there. I will be making some reference to the differences between Six Sigma and Lean uh, in this particular presentation. You know, it would not be uncommon um, some time ago if you were in the hallways of maybe a healthcare organization to hear someone asking, well, who is Sigma and why is she sick? You won't uh, hear that so much anymore. Um, and after today, you'll learn a lot more about Six Sigma. We'll start with an introduction to the Six Sigma's DMAIC framework. Uh, we'll compare Six Sigma to the lean methodologies, as I mentioned. I have a proof of concept uh, exercise in here, and uh, we'll also go through a relevant case study. Starting with a little bit of humor, two Six Sigma black belts sitting at a bar, one says to the other, are you just pissing and moaning or can you verify what you're saying with data? I think this came from the Wall Street Journal and it calls attention to uh, really one of the central requirements to do Six Sigma work and that is reliable data. Uh, I know many organizations don't have confidence in their data. The good news is Six Sigma introduces you to some techniques uh, that can help you to convert that data to something that you can trust and something that you can leverage, and we'll, we'll cover that in today's program. Well, what is Six Sigma? Six Sigma is many things. It, fundamentally, however, it is a process improvement methodology, a methodology that is grounded in literally centuries of practice uh, over the years and generations. Uh, originally, uh, Six Sigma techniques could be found in the pre-industrial uh, era by farmers that were leveraging statistical concepts to uh, increase the yield from crop production. And so these techniques uh, have, um, have been used literally for centuries and um, they've contributed greatly to our capabilities in the area of agriculture, manufacturing and, and, uh, and service as well. As you see here in this abstract, what Six Sigma is telling us is that any process is uh, the sum of many variables that go into that process. We call them Xs. Um, do all the variables matter to the same degree? Well, not necessarily. Some matter more than others. Um, but they, they do come together within a process to produce an output variable that we call the Y. And that Y needs to be compatible with customer requirements. Now in Six Sigma work, what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine which variables matter the most. We're seeking that critical X, the one that has the greatest influence on our Y. The philosophy being that if we can find that critical X, then really nothing else matters more than optimizing that input so we can uh, create the variable Y that is going to be most compatible with customer requirements. That's why one of the reasons we say that we, we aim to fix the problem for the last time, many organizations are simply not willing or able to do this kind of investigatory work to find the critical X, and they may be looking at more the low-hanging fruit, more obvious um, indicators of poor process performance, and never really taking the time to do as much for that process as they could uh, with the Six Sigma methodology. Six Sigma also gives us a very robust product management roadmap summarized here using the uh, very popular acronym known as DMAIC, the successive stages of defining the problem, measuring the process to get a baseline level of performance, analyzing the process to identify all of the X's and to, and to subsequently uh, identify that critical X. 
improving the process by optimizing the inputs, conducting various small-scale experiments and interventions, and then finally controlling and sustaining the gains that you have made through control pl plans and, and, uh, and techniques that give you greater visibility into that process than you ever had before because of all the work that, that, uh, that you did preceding the control phase. In the background, you can see the image there of a funnel. What we're trying to convey is that as you're moving down this path, your understanding of the process improves, your, your understanding of the variables improves significantly, and you're, you're moving down the path of, of eliminating uh, those Xs. They may have been sort of the usual suspects that you turn to when you suspect a, pro a process is not performing well, um, but you're moving through that funnel and, and, and iteratively finding those X's that matter the most. Now you'll see many different techniques under each of these phases. Uh, a, a skilled Six Sigma practitioner knows which one of these to apply and when to apply them. Some of them are mutually exclusive and actually the list is much longer than you see here. These are just some representative samples of some of the things that would be done during a typical Six Sigma project. What is counterintuitive for folks is that the cycle time, the time to complete the define and measure phase in, in itself can take as long as the analyze, improve, and control phases taken together. The reason for that is quite simply, we want to make certain that we are all in agreement on what it is that we're working on. You know, it's not very satisfying to go down the path of a project only to have your legs cut out from under you when you find out that it wasn't management's priority or that you didn't have uh, you know, reliable data. And so we spend um, quite a bit of time in the define phase, making certain that everybody agrees that this is a problem worth solving um, through unambiguous project charters that make it very, very clear to everybody what we want to accomplish. And then rely gathering reliable measurements um, can also take quite a bit of time. Um, by the time we have completed the, the define and measure phase, we are confident that we have a project worth doing. Uh, quite often, in fact, I think most of the time we find that the process performance was worse than we thought. Um, but in the unlikely scenario, after the measure phase, we may be find that it is better than we thought and we do not need to actually continue with the project in that particular scenario. Six Sigma is also a metric. It is It defines a level of performance that for all practical purposes is a perfect process. And here you can see in this abstract, um, a process that is fairly reliable. It's operating well within the lower spec limit that you see there off to the left and well within the upper spec limit that is there off to the right. Um, it's operating within a fairly tight range. And so you would have a high degree of confidence in knowing generally where the next data point is going to fall. Well, folks, this happens to be a six sigma process. You can fit six standard deviations, the average variation from the mean, between that mean and the nearest specification limit, six standard deviations between the mean and the, and the specification limit gives rise to a six sigma process. As I mentioned, for all practical purposes, it's a perfect process. This process will produce a defect only 3.4 times per million occurrences. I'll repeat that. A Six Sigma process performs at the level of 3.4 DPMO, 3.4 defects per million occurrences, for all practical purposes, a perfect process. Can we reach Six Sigma for every process that we attempt to manage? It's not easy, of course, and particularly for labor intensive processes where different people may be performing the same thing in different ways. Uh, processes that are subject to a high degree of regulation may include some regulatory requirements and steps that uh, mitigate the efficiency of the process, but, um, but, are, but are required not, nevertheless. So it, it can be very challenging to get to this level of performance. We're at this level of performance for uh, passenger safety on airlines. Uh, we're not at this level of performance for baggage handling, but I think you'd have to agree that our priorities are in the right place. We would never tolerate um, them being reversed where our bags are more likely to get safely to the destination than we are. But ultimately, Six Sigma as a methodology also gives us this sort of visceral goal that we want to continue to get better and better um, in terms of how our processes perform with Six Sigma being the ultimate goal. 
How does Six Sigma work? Well, we start by identifying and eliminating NVA activity. NVA stands for non-value added activity. And where have we heard that before? If you participated in the lean program that we've offered, or if you have had any experience with lean, you'll know that eliminating non-value added activity is really central to the lean methodology. And so lean and Six Sigma are in fact very close cousins um, in, that, in that respect. But Six Sigma also goes further to attempt at reducing variation. Why do we talk about reducing variation instead of eliminating it altogether? We're frankly simply being realistic that variation will never be eliminated entirely. If you try to get to your job every day in let's say 20 minutes, not one second longer, not one second shorter, you'll find that it is not gonna happen. There's things that are gonna get in the way. And so we've simply come to appreciate that there's some background noise in, in every process that is going to give rise to some variation, but as a goal, Six Sigma aims to reduce it as much as possible so that, that process can be more predictable. Finally, we wanna understand and optimize this equation, which might look a little frightening, but is simply suggesting that the output, the Y, is a function of many inputs summarized by the X's. Um, and our goal is to optimize the interrelationship between the X's, the inputs, so that we can optimize the Y, as I suggested before. I like to use the analogy here of my, my home stereo because I love music and I love to feel like I'm in the presence of the band when I'm playing my music at home. Well, if you think about the typical home stereo as well as the, the, the environment in which the stereo exists, you know that there are many variables that are going to influence how that music sounds to me. Um, there's going to be the volume, of course, the balance, the treble. There's going to be the quality of the speakers, the acoustics of the room, um, whether or not there's anything outside the room that might be interfering with my ability to hear the music or enjoy it. And so really what we're talking about with this equation and with Six Sigma generally is the settings on the knobs. You know, where does the volume need to be in our process? Where does the balance need to be? Where is the treble? And, and, and you know, what are the settings on the knobs generally to create that optimal performance? And so that analogy might be useful to you as you look at the processes where you think Six Sigma might be able to make a difference. As I mentioned with Six Sigma, we're, we're concerned with the impact of variation on process performance. We're concerned with the, uh, the graph that you see here, which is known as, which describes a dynamic known as Little's Law. Little's Law suggests that as you are getting closer and closer to 100% utilization of a process, at some point you're going to hit a point of diminishing returns. There will be an exponential rise in the cycle time or the work in process. The process simply cannot handle any more activity. It's, it's already choking on what's in it. And we experience this dynamic you know, literally every day. If you've gone to Disneyland and you've had to wait 45 minutes for a five minute ride, you're experiencing this dynamic. If you have been on the phone with your airline recently and due to their fabulous low fares, your wait time was longer than usual, uh, here again, you've been subject to this to this, uh, the, to this law. Finally, if you have been in an emergency department and you see patients in the waiting room that really should be in a treatment room, you're seeing the, the effect of this law. There is n the emergency department is simply too full and they cannot get that patient back where he or she belongs. Now you've noticed that there are actually three lines here describing the same process. The line on the um, that is pink is performing the best. It is it is very close to the x-axis. You can push this process nearly to the limit without any significant rise in cycle time. Versus the brown line, which is performing the worst. You get um, this very sharp rise in cycle time. The process cannot handle any more activity now. If this was an emergency department, the emergency department's typical response to this scenario is that they would go on diversion. They divert patients. They don't take any more patients. Those patients are sent on to other facilities. It's not very good for the patients um, and it's not very good for the hospital because they will lose that revenue. 
what the hospital is trying to do is to push their way down this brown line until they can reduce the chaos around them. They're not fixing the process. They're just kicking the can down the road. Now, what we understand from Little's law is, again, looking at these three different, pro uh, three different uh, um, approaches to the same process is that the difference between them is represented by the impact of variation. You have different people doing the same thing, but they're doing it differently, particularly on that brown line. Now, the pink line, your group has pretty much normalized around best practices. They're doing it the best way and they're reaping the benefits. In the brown line, you have folks that are, you know, have their own personal workarounds, uh, other folks that are following the standard operating procedures and others that are not. What we know from Little's law is that if, if we can reduce the variation in a process, we can jump down to one of these lower lines and push the process further and improve the yield. Now, often if capital is available, the, the path of least resistance is simply to build a bigger one, build a bigger emergency department, build a bigger factory. Well, as is probably evident by now, uh, if that was the path taken, that you would be building a bigger one with the same problems. And if you are going to build a bigger one, you'd best approach this issue first. So that as you move into that bigger environment, you can take full advantage of, uh, of all of the resources and benefits that it's offering you. Well, what makes Six Sigma so different from other methodologies? We would be the first to say that we do not want our clients to be throwing out the methodologies that are working for them. We wanna honor what has worked for you before, but there are some specific situations in which Six Sigma um, really shines and is quite different. First of all, we don't wanna devote the resources to doing Six Sigma work unless we can, unless we expect that we can achieve a very significant improvement goal. And we don't, want to, uh, we don't want to reach that goal by adding resources or adding steps. Our goal is more with less. So we're not likely to want to um, add inspection or add more people. As we break down that process and reveal the critical Xs, we're often going to find that we can build that process back up again with fewer steps and achieve a higher level of reliability by leveraging the statistical tools that are available to us. Finally, there's really, uh, truly is an opportunity for cultural transformation when Six Sigma is uh, embraced by an organization. You will see people becoming very restless with the status quo. They will want to apply Six Sigma to all the processes that they feel can perform much better than they do today. As I mentioned, there are some similarities between Six Sigma and Lean. Um, and while we talk about Six Sigma as focusing on the critical X or the critical few variables, we might think of Lean as focusing on the trivial many, you know, the low hanging fruit and non-value added activity that is the target for Lean. Lean focuses on speed, efficiency, and the elimination of waste, while Six Sigma focuses on defects reducing the variation that causes defects in the overall quality of products and processes. And so they are indeed very close cousins. They both also provide a very prescriptive method for improvement. What I mean by that is both Lean and Six Sigma will inform the practitioner on what to do first, what to do next, and what to do after that. They literally give you a formula that if followed, will produce an improved process. And in many, many cases, it's going to be a combination of the tools for organizations that have invested the time to study and drive both of these methods into the organization. Now, if you're a literal person like me, um, you might prefer illustrations to, to make the same point. If there are things that you're doing that uh, cost too much or take too long, as you see in the upper left-hand corner here, scenario A, uh, you might consider the lean methodologies to center that process along the lines of the customer requirements. So you can see in the case of the A scenario, there's something that we're doing that is pulling that performance to the left while the customer requirement is that tall vertical line that is a little off center. If on the other hand, your process is so darn un unpredictable, you have no confidence to say where the next data point is gonna fall that being scenario B, then the Six Sigma methodology is gonna be your best bet. Many organizations will apply lean first and then step back and see if they are satisfied. If not, then consider the Six Sigma methodology. 
A combination of them, as I mentioned a moment ago, might be required to center that process. Um, but in the end, the most important point on this slide is in the box at the bottom, and that is it's critical to understand the impact of variation on processes because your customers experience the variation in your processes. And you can develop a real false sense of security if all you're doing is looking at averages because you're insulating yourself from the spread. You're insulating yourself from the variation that your customers are experiencing. And so now we have come upon our proof of concept. And um, as a caveat here, I want to point out I normally conduct this exercise with a live audience, but I do think that for the purposes of today's program, it is still worth sharing, and you will have the opportunity to share it with your team as well if you find that it is valuable. I'm going to tee up the exercise and give you some instructions, then I'll pause to allow you some time to complete the exercise, and then we'll talk more about it. Essentially, what I'm doing here is I'm hiring you as an inspector to find and count the number of Fs in this particular paragraph. I want to emphasize that this is a matter of life or death. I want you to take, please, as much time as you need. It's essential that we get the right answer, and we need to agree also that there is only one right answer. Uh, these are the same instructions I give my live audiences, and I've had um, well over 100 people at one time doing this exercise. And the results are always quite interesting. So I'm going to stop speaking for a moment in the event you wish to pause the program. And then um, I'll come back and debrief. All right. Talk to you in a sec. So hopefully by now you've completed the exercise. And uh, better yet, if you could do it twice, um, you'd find how challenging it is to come up with the right number. Uh, when I do this with large audiences, I'm always surprised at how many people far, fall far below the actual number that is there. I've actually found somebody who found more Fs that are really there. I don't know how that happened, but the bottom line is that there is a huge amount of variation in my audience uh, in terms of finding the number of Fs in the paragraph. There's always a small percentage of people that are insisting I tell them how many are in there. And there's probably some folks on my program that are wondering the same thing. And I always respond that it doesn't really matter how many are in there. And honestly, I've forgotten. Um, that's the real truth. But um, finding the right number of Fs seems to be a very significant challenge for folks that uh, engage in this exercise. I suspect some of them fall into the state of being unconsciously incompetent. They're looking at an F, but they don't see it. Um, others are in a hurry. Uh, even though I give the audience as much time as they need, and I emphasize over and over again that this is a matter of life and death, and please take as much time as you need, in spite of those efforts and instructions, the number of people that get the right answer is painfully low. It really begs the question, is inspection a sensible strategy to be the foundation of a performance improvement effort? And yet we love to inspect. We give it fancy names and, and euphemisms, as you see here, auditing, observation, supervising, survey, reviewing, management by walking around. Um, no matter the industry, it seems that we love to inspect. And we have some people that uh, their entire job uh, is, is little more than uh, inspection related. Well, some smart people got together and have predicted that in order to find and fix all of the defects in a process, you would need six sequential inspectors um, to come anywhere near a level of Six Sigma performance. In fact, most of the time, the first level inspection will detect no more than 80% of the defects that are present. And I can tell you from having conducted this very simple exercise with very simple requirements, hundreds of times over, that my audiences are far short of the 80% mark. So probably more likely around the 40% mark of finding the defects that are present. This causes us to put forth the very bold claim that inspection is fundamentally unproductive. We would argue that it would be a better use of resources to take the time and money that you spend on inspection and plow it into creating processes that are incapable of producing an error. 
that is actually, uh, there is actually a name associated with that approach. It's called error proofing, and it falls within the Six Sigma methodology. So just to repeat, because it's profound and important, inspection is fundamentally unproductive, and you would be better served to take the time, money, and resources that you spend on inspection to create processes that are incapable of producing an error. Well, if you can't trust your eyes, can you trust your technology? The caption says, you're pointing at it won't help. The computer record shows none in stock. How often has this happened to you? This opens the door to a discussion about data integrity. And the reason this is an important discussion is that it has been suggested that half of all measurement systems, half of all measurement systems are incapable of producing accurate measurements. I'll draw attention once again to, to the exercise we just completed as evidence. And yet the industry is replete with example, uh, examples of well-intentioned performance improvement efforts that went south because they were based on unreliable data. This can be a demoralizing set of truths that cause many organizations to just throw up their hands and to think what's and to say and think, you know, what's the point? Fortunately, Six Sigma gives us some approaches, some, some logical prescriptive approaches that can help us to understand, can we trust our data? And if we can't trust our data, what do we need to do about it? We start with the premise that data is guilty until proven innocent. But the good news here is that you don't need to collect millions of data points to conduct what we call an R&R &R study, a, repeatable, a repeatability and reproducibility study, formerly known as a gauge R&R &R study. R&R &R methods pave the way to help us answer if the data is reliable. Is it, is it, it will be reliable if it is repeatable and if it is reproducible. Then and only then are we in a position to comment on the capability of that process. In other words, is the process capable of meeting customer expectations? Frankly, we have no business to comment on the quality of a process until we have gone down this path. So let's take a look at a couple of examples, starting with the reap, reap, repeatability study within a gauge r and &R. Repeatability is a very low bar. Taking, for example, the, time we, the times we check the oil in our car, um, what I was taught by my dad was you put the dipstick in, um, you pull it out, you wipe it off with a rag, you put it in again, you pull it out, and you look at the results. And if the two times that you looked at the level of oil in your car is approximately the same, you have a fair degree of confidence that you know whether or not you need to put oil in the car. So it's a very low bar. It's the variation that you see when you take repeated measurements under identical conditions. And yet, as low a bar as it is, I still cannot get those inexpensive digital thermometers that I buy from Walgreens or CVS to give me repeated measurements when I'm trying to see if my daughter has a fever. Maybe you've had the same issue. And so repeatability is, yes, a low bar, but it is a very important bar. We have a higher degree of confidence that we can trust our measurements if we repeat the measurement taking over and over again and get essentially the same result. A much higher bar is reproduce reproducibility. Reproducibility is the variation that results from different conditions, different operators measuring the same thing or different environmental conditions or locations. When we did the exercise to count the number of Fs in a paragraph with an audience of many people, we were essentially doing a reproducibility study. Would different members of my audience come up with different results? Well, in fact, they did. And in fact, we were able to determine that from the standpoint of my audience, they are not a very reliable gauge. I cannot trust them to give me the right answer. Let me give you an example from a health system to uh, illustrate how a gauge r, r study might be done in the real world. A health system um, is concerned that radiologists can read films accurately because sometimes those films can have very uh, important implications for the patients represented by them. And it's essential that radiologists are able to read the films in an accurate and reliable manner. One system that we've worked with will make 60 films once a quarter. They will gather 60 films, and within the 60, 20 of them will be repeated. So there's really only 40 unique films. 
the organization will measure the percentage of time that the radiologist will agree with himself or herself upon finding the same film that was randomly shuffled within the deck. Repeatability study. They will also measure the percentage of time that different radiologists agree with each other upon reviewing the same film, a reproducibility study. When the percentages fall below a certain level, and I believe 90% is the general threshold, we want to see agreement 90% of the time at a minimum. When it flows, falls below that threshold, the organization knows that an intervention is necessary, that there's going to need to be some additional training. The chief medical officer should come in and adjudicate any of the differences. Uh, and this process is repeated four times a year, once per quarter. So there you have an example of a repeatability and reproducibility study, a true full-fledged gauge R&R within a health organization, health system organization. Sigma, Six Sigma levels are expressed as Z-scores, and Z-scores are determined based on the comparison of the voice of the customer with the voice of the process. There is a lot to unpack in this slide, so I'm going to go slow. Um, to make sure that we cover it and cover everything um, in a reasonable fashion. What we're looking here in this abstract is obviously you can see the normal bell curve. Um, and all we're looking at here is the voice of the process. All we see is the performance of this particular process, which is the amount of time it takes for a health system to establish the credentials for a new physician. So the physician submits their uh, their application, the credentialing cycle time is the time it takes for the organization to determine whether or not that physician will be approved to practice in the facility. The average number of days that it takes to do this is 20. The standard deviation is five days. So one standard deviation from the mean is going to be 25 days. Now, all we're looking at is the performance of the process or what I've described as the voice of the process. We establish capability when we compare the voice of the customer to the voice of the process. And we have no business commenting on the quality of this process or any process until we know the voice of the customer. So all we're really looking at right now is the process. And we ask the question, should we improve this process? In order to answer that question, we need to marry the voice of the process seen here with the voice of the customer. If our customer expects to be approved within 30 days, now should we improve this process? Well, as you can see from the illustration, we're at a two sigma level and we're satisfying the majority of the applicants, but there is still a very significant percentage of applicants that are gonna become frustrated and angry. That's to the right of the 30 day mark because the process is not going to be performing to their expectations. So at a sigma level of two, we have a pretty poor process. The sigma level, again, being determined by marrying the voice of the customer, the red line, with the voice of the process, which is the normal bell curve. If, on the other hand, the applicant was satisfied to be approved within 50 days, well, now we're operating at nearly a six sigma level of performance, and there will be a nearly no probability of us not being able to meet the customer expectation. So as you can see here, how important it is to marry the performance of the process or the VOP with the expectation of the customer, the voice of the customer, the VOC. When we combine the two, we can express the capability of this process and we can move into the improvements to this process if necessary. So what if you have reliable measurements and yet you don't want to invest the time in becoming a Six Sigma black belt? Um, you can apply DMAIC, um, the DMAIC methodology, or instead you can use what I call an uncommon approach to common cause variation. This is a secret that I will share with you that even without the benefit of a Six Sigma credential, you can begin leveraging the Six Sigma concepts immediately after this program. First, we need to understand the anatomy of a control chart. I hope that everybody on this program is receiving control charts from their subordinates. If you are not receiving control charts as a way of determining if a process is performing to expectation, you should demand control charts. 
and we can provide the training as well as the tools on how to create them. In this abstract, you can see the shadow of a histogram turned on its side and the data points, the observation being rolled out to the right uh, along the red line here and the many dots that represent the individual observations. You see an upper control limit and a lower control limit beyond which we are viewing the special cause variation because those observations went far beyond what we would have expected to see from this particular process. In this abstract, we're seeing only common cause variation. We're not seeing any special cause variation. And in a stable process, virtually all of the variation is going to be common cause variation. When we build out this chart, each dot represents one observation. The middle line that you see there in green is representing our mean. And the control limits are the red lines on either side of the observation. Now, many software products will set those control limits automatically at plus or minus three standard deviations. But if you had a red line beyond which you could not pass, um, you can override the software generally and set those manually. Any point inside the control limits represents common cause. Anything outside is generally being subject to some physics that were not anticipated by the process, something that is pushing that observation outside the limits. We call it a special cause uh, variation. Trends, shifts, and cycles also constitute special cause. Basically, special cause variation is something that is influencing the performance of that process that was never anticipated. Many times you can detect these with the naked eye. In the case of a trend, a series of data points going in either increasingly up or increasingly down. In the case of a shift, it might be a very dramatic movement from one point to another. And in the case of a cycle, it's some repeated series of measurements that seems to have some sort of logical repetitive pattern to it. When you look at these situations, you generally recognize them for what they are. They're hiding in plain sight. If you're knowledgeable about the process, you don't need to conduct a Six Sigma um, evaluation or analysis to figure out what's going on. Usually you or someone close to the process will uh, be able to readily identify what happened and what's causing it. Special cause variation often responds well to just do it projects. Don't invest in a six month project um, just fix it. Rather than fix it, you would just fix it. Um, take the data points that you have, and generally someone will be able to explain to you what caused them, and you can intervene with some error-proofing techniques to make sure that that observation is never repeated again. On the other hand, we have common cause variation. And common cause variation is a much more stubborn form of variation, because common cause variation is actually giving you what is considered a statistically stable process, whether you like it or not. The observations will certainly display a random pattern, but they will be within the control limits. And many managers get very frustrated when, when looking at common cause variation and will try to wrestle common cause variation through threats and incentives and campaigns uh, none of which are likely to have any long-lasting benefits. Um, improvements to common cause variation are only possible by fundamentally altering the way that process was built. I'm going to show you in the next series of slides how easy it is to start the conversation about how to wrestle with common cause variation. Here we have again an abstract of process. Uh, we'll call this a process that is measuring cycle time. I think we all know that when we're measuring cycle time, faster is better. So it doesn't take us much of a stretch to look at the observations on the lower half of our graph and to say that we like them. Conversely, it doesn't take uh, any more effort to look at the ones above the green line and say that we don't like them. Here is the question that is going to make some people feel uncomfortable but is completely legitimate. And that is, if we can be this good some of the time, why can we not be this good all of the time? Mind you, we are not asking people to be any better than they have already been. 
we're not asking them to perform any better than they've already done. And if you look here in this particular abstract, there were actually two consecutive observations where the stars and planets aligned and we were able to perform very, very well relative to all other observations. What happened on those days? If you have a good measurement system, what happened on those days will be very obvious to you. It will be in your measurements. And once you have determined where the critical X is with respect to this particular process, you will be able to optimize that critical X or Xs and repeat that performance over and over again. And that is the essence of Six Sigma work. Let's look at an actual case study. And um, this is a case study that we conducted on behalf of a healthcare organization. We were able to bring to bear on their problem everything that we knew about Lean and Six Sigma in one project. And um, it's a great opportunity for us to illustrate how one moves through the DMAIC process in the course of doing improvement work. Now, I want to point out we're sparing you a lot of the blind alleys that one will go down, a lot of the paths that will inevitably um, be examining that don't produce any important findings. And so this is a sort of an abbreviation of a project that probably took us about four months to complete. Here we have the project charter. This was a cycle time project in the hospital laboratory. The hospital laboratory served the uh, entire hospital, both the inpatient units as well as the emergency department. In the emergency department, there was one very critical test known as troponin. Troponin allows a physician to understand if a patient is in the early stages of having a heart attack. So seconds can mean the difference between life and death when it comes to having an accurate result from troponin. In this particular case, the organization was striving for 60 minutes or less. That was the standard at the time that this particular project was done. I think the standard is even lower now. Um, so keep in mind that this was done several years ago. And they were very demoralized because they actually had more failures than successes. Their sigma level, as you see there in the bottom right-hand corner, was negative. They had more failures than successes in trying to produce a result in under 60 minutes. Now, the only data that they could produce for us was, as you can see on this chart here, and if you didn't know any better, your eyes would immediately be drawn to the RV stage, and you might suggest, well, the problem is there. Troponin compared to other tests is performing much worse on that, on, on that particular stage. But what you need to know is the RV stage takes longer than the other stages combined. So what we have is a, th a three-step process. Uh, the order to draw phase, as you see uh, summarized as OD, is the time it takes from, the, from uh, the, the moment that the test is ordered until the time that the blood is drawn for the test. That's the OD phase. The draw to receive phase is the time from, the, um, the time from drawing the blood until the blood sample is received in the laboratory. And the final RV stage is from the time that it is received in the laboratory until, they have, until the time that they have verified that the result has provi been provided back to the physician. So the sum of those three individual steps give rise to the total cycle time. And again, if you didn't know any better, you know, you would say it was in that final stage and call it a day, but it's a lot more complicated than that. One of the first things that we did was to construct a process flow diagram, and I understand that you won't be able to read the contents of these particular um, symbols, but if you attended my program on lean, you would be probably able to answer the question in the lower right-hand corner, what's wrong with this picture? You'll recall from that program that one of the litmus tests that we often use in determining if a process is too complicated and too complex is to look for the diamonds. The diamonds set forth the decision rules about whether the process is going to move forward or back. If you're looking at a process flow diagram and there are no diamonds and it probably wasn't documented accurately, if you're looking at a process flow diagram and there are a lot of diamonds, then you probably have a process that is too complicated. And that is certainly what seems to be true in the case of this particular process for troponin. We move into the measure phase, um, and you can see some of the activities that we would conduct there, similar to what you saw earlier 
uh, in the slide deck where we had the funnel. We're determining whether the process is stable, what the baseline performance is, whether we can trust the data, establishing the capability of the process, and also integrating subjective input from our client. Starting with the subjective input, it's often important to know what the prevailing conventional wisdom is in the organization in the event that we're going to need to debunk it later. Oftentimes, people close to the process have a very good understanding of the obstacles, but they're also biased as well because they may only see a part of the process. That seemed to be the case in asking the question here, what are the obstacles to improving turnaround time and delivering lab results to the emergency department? What they said first was what you see at the top. What they said next was, when are the layoffs going to happen? The individuals uh, naturally felt very nervous that consultants were coming in uh, and looking at the performance of the process because they felt that inevitably some of them were going to be um, weeded out as poor performers. And we had to say, you know, many times over, it's not about the people, it's about the process. We, we don't think that you come into work every day and say, I'm going to have a variation of 20 minutes. Um, we're assuming people are coming in to do their very best work, and it's the process that's working against them. And besides, rogue employees are not going to be um, remediated through Six Sigma. That is a human resources issue. But the feedback that came back from the people that participated in a ranking exercise from us was also very misleading. The top three reasons why they felt that the lab could not perform well dealt with the phlebotomist not being available, they couldn't find the patient, or the patient didn't cooperate. But if you look back at our project charter and the cycle times associated with the three different steps, um, these are all steps that dealt with the order to draw phase. These are the, you know, the first step in the three-step process that only took 17% of the total cycle time. So really, no matter how efficient you were, were in terms of getting the, the phlebotomist in front of the patient, having the patient cooperate, you really were not going to make that big of a difference in terms of the overall performance of this process. And it was very ironic that these were rated so highly. Our observations uh, and the data that we collected suggested that there were some other issues that were perhaps um, representing greater opportunities. We recognized that there were multiple draws in other words, the phlebotomist was drawing blood from more than one patient. There really wasn't good communication. There wasn't a very efficient workflow. But the thing about multiple draws was interesting because, again, if you attended the program on lean, multiple draws um, you'll, will remind you of something that we spent quite a bit of time talking about in that lean program, and that was batching. In the process of drawing blood from multiple patients, the phlebotomist was essentially batching the blood. And we felt that that was certainly worth examining further to see if that was uh, uh, um, standing in the way of better, better performance. Is there a difference between phlebotomists? Sure, there is going to be a difference between phlebotomists. What you see in this particular slide is, is the variation of individual phlebotomists off to the left. And their identity, the factor levels, would be on the right. But we have uh, concealed those because, first of all, it's private information. And second of all, we feel it's irrelevant. We don't feel that browbeating the staff is the answer to getting better performance from this process. We knew there was going to be variation. It's the kind of thing that you would say that's interesting. You wouldn't necessarily say that the critical X is the fact that one of these phlebotomists is not performing as well as the others. Um, you would set that aside and you might come back to it later, but uh, at least in the course of, of doing this work, we didn't think that that was where the opportunity existed. We looked at the performance of the process just to make certain that we could have a reliable baseline. And on the top half here, you can see the common cause variation represented by that bell curve. And then immediately below that, you can see that in the red circle there, we've identified quite a bit of special cause variation going way out to over 400 minutes um, being required to complete this test. The overall performance of this process was at close to 80 minutes, as you look at the mean there. So while they had a goal of 60 minutes, they were close to 20 minutes above that goal on an average. And due to the variation, they were you know, quite a bit um, far from meeting that goal most of the time. 
Incidentally, uh, one of the things we found in doing this work was that as they added the three steps together, the order to draw, draw to receive, and receive to verify steps, as those were added together, there were situations in which the test was ordered by the physician after the blood was drawn for some other reason. This gave rise to a negative value in the database because they were being subtracted. The times were being subtracted from each other. The negative values in the database was actually lowering the average turnaround time. In other words, if they didn't know any better, the process was actually performing much worse than they thought. Another good reason to do this, um, the gauge RNR study, is to simply reveal those kinds of problems so that you can clean up the database as we did before producing this number here. The 78.7 number is an accurate number because we had by this time resolved the issue of the negative numbers in the database to produce a reliable baseline. Moving into the analyze phase, we round up the usual suspects. People are going to want to look at the staff and look at the shifts, um, but there were some other uh, critical Xs that we thought were um, possibly out there and worth validating, and so we teed up a number of hypothesis tests. You'll recognize the symbol off to the left is the one that was in your statistics textbook the day before you sold it back to the college bookstore. That is the conventional wisdom, um, the null hypothesis that we were seeking to debunk uh, through our hypothesis testing, starting with there's no impact from the order time or order date, no difference between the phlebotomists, no significant delay due to multiple draws, no impact from the use of the pneumatic tube system that was there to help, this, uh, help the um, samples get quickly to the laboratory, and no significant loss of uh, time from the instrument processing to the delivery of results. We had already demonstrated there, there was indeed a, a difference um, in performance between um, the shifts in terms of the time and date. And again, we felt that it was not uh, worth examining that further. Uh, clearly, the graveyard shift is going to perform better than the daytime shift because of just the volume of work moving through it. Um, we already knew that there was going to be a difference across phlebotomists, but we decided that we were going to set that aside. And so it was the bottom three here that I'm going to show you next in terms of the results we found when we examined them. First of all, does a multiple draw cause cycle time to increase or decrease, or is it unrelated? We were able to tease this out of the database because um, we were able to find the individual phlebotomists and to determine whether they were checking in one sample or more than one sample at a time. Um, most often they would check in one sample and then go and get orders for another patient, but um, oftentimes they were checking in multiple samples at one time. So on the left you can see the single draw and on the right you can see the multiple draw um, when we're looking at both the order to draw and the draw to receive, receive phase combined. If you look at the mean, you can see that there's a difference of five minutes, more or less. The multiple draw was adding five minutes to the entire uh, cycle time versus the single draw. Does five minutes matter when seconds can mean the difference between life and death? You bet it does. And for a test that was at 80 minutes that we wanted to get down to 60, that five minutes was a very significant finding that we've considered to be one of our first critical Xs. And sometimes you can produce a fancy statistical test um, if, you know, if it's not obvious to the naked eye that uh, you've got a better process. Um, you run a stati statistical test to prove it. In this case, you can see that the confidence intervals between the multiple draw and the single draw don't even overlap. And the p-value of 0.0, .0 indicates that there is a 0% probability that we're looking at random variation across two different measurements. In other words, this statistical test is telling us that these two processes being measured are operating under completely different physics. The multiple draw is subject to one set of physics and the single draw to another, the single draw performing so much better that the confidence intervals don't even overlap. This is the moods medians test that we're showing you here. The next question we wanted to ask was, does it make a difference if the phlebotomist sends the sample through the uh, pneumatic tube system or drops it physically directly at the lab? So the, there was no standard operating procedure here for 
uh, for the phlebotomist. They had the option of either putting the sample in the pneumatic tube system, which would ferry the sample very quickly through the uh, hospital and drop it at the accessioning center uh, within the laboratory um, environment. Or they could physically take the tube and put it at the technician's bench and check it in at that point. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, the result when they use the pneumatic tube system uh, versus the right-hand side uh, when they physically put the uh, sample at the technician's bench. Um, when they use the pneumatic tube system, it took 14 and a half minutes. When they physically took it to the bench, it took them 10.7 minutes. Again, a difference of about four minutes. Um, we previously found we could save five minutes um, if we eliminated batching. Now we find we can save four minutes if we eliminated the use of the pneumatic tube system. Five plus four equals nine. Does that matter? When we're trying to reduce a test from 80 minutes to 60, you bet it does. Um, and so here we found yet another critical X that we felt could contribute significantly to the improvement of this process by having the technician um, bring those troponin results directly to the technician. Finally, does it take a significant amount of time for the technician to inspect and release, release results? Um, these are um, tests that are evaluated by a very, very big piece of capital equipment. The capital equipment is often on one side of the laboratory and the technician's on the other. Uh, it could be spitting out a result and the technician wouldn't even know it. And sure enough, if you look at this slide, uh, you can find the maximum value here was 235 minutes. What is that over three hours? Uh, the results sitting there um, and, and a couple of others that were not quite so long, but were still sitting there much longer than they should have been. The average overall being 7.8 minutes, 7.9, let's just round it up to eight minutes um, of, of um, a statistical result, a, a test result sitting on a piece of equipment. Now, the negative results went to the doctor immediately. The positive results had to be evaluated by a technician before sent to the physician to make sure that they weren't you know, setting off a false positive. Um, and that eight minutes was, again, on top of the uh, nine minutes that we had already found that we could save if we were able to make all three of those changes um, and to um, make this process more efficient by taking advantage of the opportunities we had found. And so moving into the improved phase, a uh, few things that we did there, the, the, you know, the traditional FMEA was important, brainstorming solutions, and then some interventions. Um, we wanted to try a few things. Now, normally you wouldn't want to do more than one thing at a time because you wouldn't want one intervention to offset the gains of another. It can be confusing and confounding to have two things that are, um, two interventions uh, at play at one time. We felt we could afford to do this because we had three distinct and discrete steps. Again, the order to draw, draw to receive, and receive to verify steps were each um, you know, pretty unique steps. One wasn't going to influence the other, and so we felt like we could afford to try three things that you see here in red. The things in black we decided to set aside for another day. The impact effort matrix identified the three things that were going to be easy to do and offer high return. So we wanted to, um, in this case, uh, ask the phlebotomists to stop doing multiple draws when a troponin was ordered, to just get the, the, the troponin uh, sample, to physically drop that off at the technician's desk to give troponin an advantage, basically. And then we used an audible alarm to expedite attention to the instrument. Then we crossed the road. We wanted to avoid any skeptics that might say, oh, well, you know, you had, you used the best phlebotomists or, oh, you used a shift that, you know, you weren't terribly busy. And so we took aside a random set of phlebotomists and we gave them the instructions to follow those three protocols. And we had them working side by side with other phlebotomists that were unknown, unbeknownst to our plan so that we had um, you know, truly a blind study that we, could, uh, that we could examine. And we got gains in every category. If you look to the right, um, during the trial, we got gains in the order to draw phase because we eliminated the multiple draws. We got gains in the draw to receive phase because we had the phlebotomist physically take the sample to the technician's desk. We got gains to the receive to verify phase because of that alarm. 
We got gains in every category. We literally hit a home run because we not only did we get them under their spec limit of 60 minutes, but we also significantly reduced the variation. So returning to a slide that you saw earlier, if, um, if this was a control chart for troponin cycle time, I would ask you to tell me what was happening on those days, those two days in a row at the bottom of this chart where we performed so well compared to all other days. And you would tell me that those are the days on which the phlebotomists didn't do multiple draws. They physically took the sample to the technician's desk and the technician was able to pay attention to the instrument. And further, if you had data like we had for this particular organization uh, available to you, you wouldn't have much trouble identifying those as being the conditions under which we produce this kind of result. Said another way, if you have done a good job in measuring the performance of a process, if you're measuring your Y and you've done a good job with the number of variables that you're tracking, all the X's come along for the ride in the course of measuring your Y and you're able to find those situations where you're performing well and you can identify the X's, the levels of the X's that made that performance possible. What we want to be able to do is to go to management and to tell them after a trial that if you, you know, if you go enterprise wide with this result, you can take it to the bank. You're going to get the same result across the rest of the organization. And indeed they did. Um, they inched just slightly over their spec limit of 60 minutes, but doing the trial and that enabled us to anticipate the impact of the expansion across the rest of the organization and to validate here that we were able to produce this result. Um, for all troponin tests. Was the improvement at the expense of other tests? You know, there's always going to be the skeptic that says, well, you gave troponin an advantage and now everything else is going to suffer. And so um, we wanted to look at how the entire department performed. Um, we looked at uh, the performance of all tests, over 7,000 tests across multiple categories. The mean across all those tests was 50 minutes before we did this project. After this project, we, we looked at uh, over 2,000 tests and found that the mean for the entire department was 43 minutes. We saved seven minutes on average across all tests. So we were able to silence the skeptics. We had a much better performing department, taking advantage of one of the concepts in, in Six Sigma known as load leveling. We were leveling the load so that troponin got the advantage it needed, but not at the expense of all of the other tests. In the control phase, we wanted to uh, we want to make sure we're holding the gains and creating a protocol around which the organization can monitor itself and not overreact, but understand uh, and to get an early warning when the process might need some further attention. And so, whereas before they the only thing that they could do was look at the overall turnaround time and bemoan the fact that they couldn't get under you know under 60 minutes, now they have a much higher level of visibility into all aspects of the performance of the process. They have a specification limit around the order to draw phase, a specification limit around the draw to receive and the receive to verify phases. As you can see on the far right, the decision rule is setting forth the conditions under which they would intervene again. Now, the reason this is important is you don't want to have to overreact at every single data point. There are gonna be some bad days and there are gonna be some special circumstances. And so this gives us a little bit of breathing room, even though we know that we can get that turnaround time for the order to draw phase somewhere you know, closer to 10 minutes, and we know that we can get, get the draw to receive phase somewhere around eight minutes, we're just giving ourselves that little bit of breathing room so we don't overreact at every single data point. But if we're measuring this monthly, and we go beyond those turnaround times, we'll have a pretty clear indication, not only that the performance of the process has eroded, but we'll know exactly where. We'll know exactly where we need to intervene, something that the organization couldn't do before. Now that the case study has been completed, I'd like to turn attention to a protocol for decision-making that I think can make your life easier, and uh, particularly if you understand control charts now and are able to have them provided to you. Let's, uh, let's unpack this. So if we are looking at common cause variation and we recognize that it is common cause variation, 
really the Six Sigma methodology is going to be your best bet to wrestle that common cause variation down to a level that you would consider to be more acceptable. You've been exposed now to a couple of different ways that we've done that and the case study as well as the shortcut that I provided earlier, both of them are leveraging Six Sigma type concepts and it's gonna involve breaking down the process, understanding what makes it tick, in other words, those critical X's so that you can bring those critical X's into a more optimal um, level of performance and reduce the variation that you're seeing. Next, if we are looking at common cause variation, but we regard it as a special cause, that is tantamount to overreacting. We are calling in the cavalry for some kind of a sentinel event something that was a signal screaming at us that would be very easy to understand in disposition. And uh, we don't need to start a Six Sigma project. We don't need to call in the cavalry. We need to bring in the people that are closest to that process and explain it to us um, and, and resist from overreacting because while this can be a career limiting event, uh, you don't need to make it that way. Moving um, to the upper right, a special cause variation that, that uh, is uh, in front of us that would be dismissed as common cause. Now we're asleep at the switch. We got that signal. Um, it can be career limiting. If we dismiss it as common cause, we're missing the opportunity to bring in the people that are closest to it, uh, to, to uh, explain what happened, to error proof it and prevent it from happening again. And God forbid it does happen again and you were asleep at the switch. Now we're back into that career limiting situation again, aren't we? And then finally, if we recognize that it, it is special cause variation and indeed it is, we simply need to fix it. Do not launch a Six Sigma project. Um, you, you do not need to call in the cavalry you can bring in the people closest to the situation, help them explain it to you, and then again, uh, consider those error-proofing uh, techniques that can prevent it from reoccurring. Uh, I used to run a call center, um, lots of data, data-rich environment, and I had people um, crying that the sky was falling all the time, so I had this uh, on my wall and we worked through it together and I found that it prevented me from doing a lot of unnecessary firefighting. At the end, we want management uh, to stop asking its employees to explain random variation. There will always be variation. The question is whether it is common cause variation or special cause variation and whether there is any cause for you to do anything about it. That is the end of uh, the academic portion of our program. I just wanted to close with a couple of minutes about our company and hope that we might continue a conversation with you about where we might be able to help. We're celebrating our 20 year anniversary in 2018. We've demonstrated a seven to one return on investment across 10 clients that we studied recently, 10 years that we supported them in 150 different projects. And we continue to prove that that seven to one ROI is uh, something that we can deliver time and again. Uh, the results are not limited to financial gains. We're proud of the fact we supported three Baldridge award-winning organizations. In each of those cases, the organization acknowledged they could not have earned that prestigious recognition without our help. Uh, you'll find a resource-rich site at creato.com, and that's where the Creato connection also exists, so you can find additional programs of value to you there. We do three things as an organization. We train in the methods of Lean and Six Sigma. We train online and we train on site. Our online training is offered all over the world by the American Society for Quality. But really the blended learning of being on site uh, um, is, is the better approach because some of this stuff um, and some of the people involved in this training really appreciate having an instructor on site and the online program can be viewed as supplemental to that effort. We provide leadership development training. We understand that leaders need to be on board from the very beginning and creating an accepting environment for change, whether that change rep is represented by a lean deployment or Six Sigma deployment, or indeed any ex existential threat in your marketplace. Um, the leadership development program leverages the concepts of emotional intelligence. This is also offered all over the US by the American College of Healthcare Executives, but most often we bring it to our clients directly. 
And from this work that we've done in the area of emotional intelligence, we've developed a program called Candidate Assessment, which is an empirical process of determining in advance if individuals will succeed or struggle in our training programs. We know we're not doing anybody any favors if we bring them in just because they're enthusiastic or available. Those are great uh, characteristics, but they're not going to determine if someone's gonna be successful. We can give our clients a rank order of the most qualified people to go into these training programs. As a result, the students will finish their projects, and that's one of the reasons why we've had such a strong return on investment. Finally, our, our PPM infrastructure. PPM stands for Project Portfolio Management. This is the glue that holds these programs together. Our product is the Compass Quality Management System, recognized as best in class according to G2 Crowd, an independent site that collects and curates end user reviews on common business applications. Compass was also recognized as the number one quality management system by CIO Review Magazine. Um, these three uh, practice areas come together to create the kind of an infrastructure that organizations need to do competent performance improvement work. We introduce them in a logical fashion, starting with the leadership, training them in the principles of emotional intelligence so that they can create an accepting environment for the change that's coming. We then conduct the candidate assessment program to find the very best people to put in our classroom. We train on-site and online in whatever methodology is the best fit for the organization. We launch the projects in Compass to get the early adoption of technology and so that people will feel supported. And then we graduate the students. We graduate them with a diploma and an affidavit. We impanel them in our registry so we can validate the credentials for third parties. And then we repeat the process and the cycle of improvement. As I mentioned, we've had a great deal of success with this approach, average return on investment seven to one. And in the last three deployments that we did, we actually validated a six to one return on investment before the first year was even finished. That completes our program. Thank you for your time and attention. You'll find more programs at creato.com forward slash events, as well as the Creato Connection. I'm gonna finish here with a very brief demonstration of the Compass Quality Management System. So hang on for that, that will be teed up next. Uh, and I wanna thank you and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye for now. Welcome to this brief demonstration of the award-winning Compass Quality Management System. Compass will literally put improvement on autopilot in your organization, completing more projects, more projects faster, and projects with greater returns. Your team will be given the tools, support, and direction necessary to drive your efforts at operational excellence and business transformation. In other words, no matter how you look at it, Compass pays for itself. No other comparable application contains as many features or as much value for the dollar. Let me show you some of the features of Compass that will support breakthrough improvement in your organization. Users can quickly add an idea to Compass by indicating the anticipated value to your organization and the specific business case. Our impact risk matrix will frame the business opportunity with little effort while the system prioritizes the idea for comparison to others. From the very first screen, Compass improves employee engagement while creating a robust pipeline of opportunities. And by the way, most of the fields you see here are actually customizable. Leverage employee feedback in Compass by comparing perception to reality for improvement opportunities. Users can comment and rate ideas while management compares workforce support to objective criteria. Your management and quality team can review the merits of each idea and resource those with greatest potential. Dynamic sorting helps you evaluate the range of opportunities more effectively than a static spreadsheet. In other words, Compass helps you to not only do things right, but to do the right things. It's no wonder Compass has been recognized as the number one idea management system compared to over 75 other applications on G2Crowd.com. Management can send feedback to users from within Compass. Show your staff that you appreciate their initiative. Ask others for the information you need. You'll be promoting collaboration and establishing accountabilities up front while communicating your support. Once an idea is approved, Compass will help drive your project. This becomes the handoff within Compass from management to staff. 
Compass makes it easy to do the right thing by guiding the user through project work, providing tools and support, and a place for documentation. Need a little direction before performing a value stream analysis? Tell Compass to get me the tool or even get me the training. Jump into the Lean online training available also from ASQ, now incorporated within Compass. This is a highly evolved program including professional audio, exercises, learning games, and case studies. At any time, send an updated A3 report to your team and stakeholders, and Compass will not only create the report, it will drop it into an email for you. Compass is compatible with PDCA, Lean, Six Sigma, ISO 9001, and any improvement method you use in your organization. Compass is a high performer for enterprise project management on G2 Crowd, and it's one of this year's top quality management systems according to CIO Review. Compass includes the entire body of knowledge for Lean to support staff new to improvement work, and it even integrates readily with SharePoint for your own intranet, enabling you to create a turnkey collaborative environment. Compass offers a highly flexible user-driven reporting portal. You can view reports in an A3 format or reports with a global view. Reports offer the ability to monitor all activity, progress against goals, and return on investment. Compass puts improvements on autopilot by automatically advising staff if their projects are ahead, behind, or missing data. Finally, we can't talk about Compass without showcasing our robust tools. Compass will literally interview each user and build a tool based on your specific needs, allowing you to create everything from a value stream analysis, Gantt or control chart, to computerized simulation. Compass can replace annual spending on dozens of disparate applications in many organizations. Bring order to chaos as Compass guides your team through the completion of projects, and management achieves true line of sight into all improvement activity in the organization. Finish more improvement projects, finish projects faster, and finish projects with stronger results all within the guidance of your compass. Compass.